Good afternoon. Uh, basically, what I'm going to do here is um, discuss uh, some things that me and other friends have been talking about for, for quite a while. Um, you know, I just figure it's kind of time. Hey, you know, that things are just getting stale around YouTube. You know, you either just have kind of the same old news, or now it's, uh, oh, basically uh, Westboro Baptist style, you know, Christians debating anybody who dares pop up and, uh, challenge any of it at all, you know, um, figure the best way to do it here. This is a very old book. It's part of my collection, um, by the Re Reverend Robert Taylor. It's basically a collection of his sermons in, uh, Ireland from uh, the uh, early 1800s, the 1830s is uh, really when he started these. He was, you know, a little uh, background on uh, the Reverend Robert Taylor. He, um, he was born in uh, the late 1700s. Uh, his dad died quite young. He, um, he was one of, the, one of seven uh, siblings from him. He became uh, a surgeon at about age 20. He was a very brilliant, very brilliant guy. Um, he's heavily into sciences and uh, became a doctor and a surgeon very early on and uh, was a renowned surgeon. He was selected. He was also, from a very early age, since his dad was also in the clergy, uh, he was also a very religious, uh, very religious guy and was selected to um, to be in the uh, clergy, actually the high uh, clergy in uh, England at the time. Um, it didn't last too long, though, because as this guy was giving his sermons back then, he was pretty quickly threatened with uh, with uh, exile for life and even uh, death or and or life imprisonment. Uh, he ended up forming uh, his own group. Uh, what, what was it called? The uh, oh, the Christian Debate Society, something like that, where he continued to give his sermons. What I've just decided to do here is um, I'm really just going to go through this book and do some 10 minute or so videos on this. I'm going to start with this as. Um, now 20, 20 or so pages into uh, his book of sermons. And uh, just go ahead and read some of this so you see what this guy is talking about. In 1830, uh, okay, part two, the Star of Bethlehem, a sermon pre uh, preached by his highness chaplain, the Reverend Robert Taylor, at the uh, Rotunda, Blackfriars Road, November 14th, 1830. Uh, from Matthew uh, 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we are come to worship him. Uh, that's basically the starting point for his sermon, which continues here. I return to this most important subject in which man is, is interested to his most delightful science in which man can be instructed. I return to the positions of this great science to which on Sunday evening last I brought up the convictions to the large auditory which honored me and themselves with the most grateful attention. The Star of Bethlehem has brought us up to the stable door. And no person of rational understanding who has traveled with us, this, with us thus far can any longer doubt that we are in possession of what you shall seek for in vain in any church or chapel or from any other minister of the gospel in this metropolis. We are in possession of the key of the stable door. Yea, we have seen it pass into the lock. You have seen it ride over all the intricacies and involutions of the words, you have heard it. 
without any strain or effort, throw the bolt, now the door is open, and behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, for unto you is born this day the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, and this shall be a sign. That is, as I have shown, this Christ the Lord shall be one of the signs of the zodiac. Walk in, ye lovers of true science, ye friends of genuine and real learning, who would assist her in the arduous struggle in which she is engaged. And aid her rapidly approaching triumph over her barbarous foes, the priests and priest-ridden dunces, who with all their pretended zeal and attachment to the gospel, when brought to the test of rational criticism, stand convinced of knowing that no more about the gospel than the gospel knows about them. They have but fed on the husks and shells of knowledge. Here, today, we have the kernel of knowledge. But why, say they, make we such a, par a parade of our learning? Why this apparat apparatus of philology, criticism, and science set before minds so little able to appreciate, so incompetent to be judge, as we must suppose the minds of the many to be? And why, if I really wish to communicate knowledge and truth to the people, why not follow the example of the preachers of the gospel and speak in such language as familiar to them, and so give them reading made easy and lectures adapted to the meanest capacity, lowest capacity? My answer is, would men be but faithful to their own capacities, there would be no mean capacities to be met with. It is only they who are afraid of hearing what they have never heard before whose capacities are mean indeed. I found it quite easy, as I am sure it is more just generous to raise the understandings of my hearers to the level of my own, and if I find them ignorant, at least not to leave them so. We are all of us ignorant before we are learned. Those who are forever for coming down to our level while we are down show but too plainly that it is the aim of their charity to keep us down. In offering instruction to my fellow men, I would treat them as my fellows and must therefore plainly tell them that it is not for me to descend, but it, but it is for them to rise. The level between us is to be found not by my humility, but by their ambition. Yeah, in other words, this guy's saying, I know this stuff. I'm not going to stoop down to your level and preach it as all the other preachers do, down to the level of the meanest, down to the lowest common denominator. I will not make myself a dunce, but I will make them scholars. Be it asked, and if I rob them of their faith, which God forgive me for being devilishly like to do, what will I give them in its stead? I answer, I will give them learning in its stead. I will set before them the treasures of science and knowledge to no worse effect than to create in them an appetite for extended information, whose craving shall never more be satisfied with the baby's lesson, nor content with the eternal repetitions of what they knew before, but shall demand continual supplies of what they did not know before. Such supplies shall increase the store of their intellectual wealth, improve their minds, enlarge their hearts, and free them from the yoke of priestcraft. You know, just as a side, don't we see this all around us? I mean, these people are, if you deviate from just uh, yelling scripture back and forth between each other, and if you say, hey, you know, there might be more to to some of this stuff than what we're, oh, God, you're, oh, you're the, de you're the damn devil. I got some girl here on YouTube, you know, call me a friggin' fag. It, oh, she, well, but she's oh, high and mighty, you know. She's guaranteed 100% saved. Yeah, all right. And now, sirs, you shall see the use of so much learning in the learned languages that shall not cost you the expense of a classroom education, nor the labor, of, uh, the labor of your whole life to attain. But as, by your few hours of diligent attention to these lectures, even with your pleasure and entertainment, 
you shall find yourselves to have acquired till there shall not be an individual of competent faculties that had been fairly applied to these studies, but who shall be better scholar than any clergyman or preacher of the gospel. If he be a dunce enough to believe the gospel himself can possibly be. See now, sirs, how we advance. As we would not a man who had but the reason and proper spirit of a man to put himself the question, if these so-called sacred writings of the New and Old Testament were written, as indeed they purport to be, and most certainly were, <coughs> in ages long ago, in conformity to the notions of men who long who have long ago ceased to exist and in languages which have long ceased to be spoken. Who but the sheerest idiot would dream of the possibility of a translation of them into modern language, or that a sense of them, according to the sense or nonsense of modern notions, could possibly come, even with a guess at their original significancy? But with the simple data of our admissions, as the axioms and postulates of this science, one, that men 10,000 years ago were of the same nature as they are at present. Their heads grew upon their shoulders, I suppose, they had eyes and ears and nose and mouth in them. That is, they had the same sources and means of acquiring ideas. Two, they had the same and no other means and ways of communicating the ideas they had acquired. Or three, the same thing made the same impressions. Four, and the same impressions could be produced the same reflections. We arrive at conclusions than which the corollaries of a mathematical problem are not more consequential and demonstrative. Of these corollaries, one of the first is that as all ideas of mankind must necessarily have been received into the mind in the same way so there must be a wonderful sameness and similarity in the modes, figures, signs, and forms of expressing those ideas, and as a wonderful a sameness of association of idea. The one calling up, an, up the other by a similar action of a similarly constituted brain in all ages and among all nations and mankind. Hence arises the large and very much extensive class of words called radicals, that is words which are the roots and bases of innumerable varieties of language, but which when analyzed are found to be essentially the same and of the same signification in all the languages of earth. You know, this is, don't you see all over YouTube, it's all this battle about a language and here these people said this, this means this, yet, what he, really what he's saying here is all men perceive things the same way, basically. So the perceptions are the same, and there's great hang-ups in language. Okay. And these, you have the advantage of learning as you learn the general chords and principles of music by your own ear. By hearing me repeat to you, as is my custom, all the different languages through which the text of which I treat has been derived, these radicals, are always monosyllables. They never require more than three letters and may often be expressed by two or only one. Hence, the earliest, most ancient languages or men are all monosyllabic. And all the combinations found with them are merely grammatical and artificial variances of the sound, but not the sense and have been reduced in much later times, sometimes poetically and tastefully, but oftener to hide and conceal the original source from which they were derived. Of which, last sort of words, you cannot have more striking specimen that in the first noun of our text, uh, the name Jesus. Of which, the last syllable, us, is no part of the word itself, but the mere Latin termination added to the only real and complete word, Jess. In other words, this guy's saying Jess means Jess, and uh, uh, a common Latin uh, term terminal word, us. Christus, uh, Christus is good Latin, but Jesus Christ is neither good Latin nor good English nor good sense. 
For in taking away the Latin termination from Christus, to re render it into the English Christ, we should take away the Latin termination from Jess and render it into Jess. The Greek word for Jesus being the, uh, basically, yeah, the uh, Greek, I-G-O-U-S, uh, which is precisely the same adoption of the Latin termination into Greek as our Jesus is uh, an adaptation of it into English. There's one among 10,000 proofs that betray the monkish Latin origin of our New Testament. I got to check for a minute and see how long this video is running. I think I only got 10 minutes. Yeah, I'm going to stop this and continue on.